Hey all you heroes, hawks, heralds, crows, pirates, and wardens. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we unpack, discuss, and galaxy brain about all the lore behind the Dragon Age series. We are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe, from character deep dives to exalted marches and elven gods. We will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast, where we talk about all things Dragon Age and its lore. I am one of your hosts, Austin, also known as Teacup. And I'm your other host, Shelby or Sheacup. And we are here after an amazing episode where we had our guest, Lewis H., and we talked about all kinds of Dragon Age absolution predictions. And this week, we're going back into our major conflicts of Thetis, and we are going the opposite direction, where last week we talked about the most recent thing that's really happened in Dragon Age to something that happened very, very early on in Thetis's history. And so, Shelby, what are we talking about today? Yeah, yeah, this is like really one of the first things, not one of the first things that happens in Thetis history, but like one of the first things that happens that we are introduced to like Andraste is a central figure. So we're talking about her and we're talking about her war specifically with Tevinter. And so this war, we often hear it just referred to as Andraste and Mafrath's war against Tevinter, but really the Chantry claims this as the first exalted March. So this is like getting into, we're going to do a whole stint on the exalted marches on all of them. Um, So yeah, that's what we're talking about today. The first one. I think this is so interesting because, you know, we've talked about the Chantry kind of being very modeled after the Catholic Church. And so for those of you who are not Catholic, which is me included, the Catholic Church will assert that the first pope is St. Peter, as in the Peter that walked around with Jesus because he is the rock on which Jesus will build the church, even though Peter never held the title of pope. And that even didn't exist until hundreds of years after his death. And so this is similar with the Exalted March, because they're claiming this is an Exalted March, even though the term didn't exist. But on the flip side, they don't claim that Andraste is the first divine. Right, but they do claim that she's the bride of the maker. Right. So it's almost like if Jesus never said he was the son of God and Christians just said, oh, he's the son of God. Right. Yeah, but no, that brings up a good point because like the exalted marches are religious crusades. We know about the crusades, the crusades from our history um, with the Catholic Church, which were, you know, Christian crusades specifically to the Middle East. Um, And there is some similarity here because they are both religious crusades, but there's a couple big differences. And the, the first one is that the exalted marches are crusades for different reasons to different people groups to different places and the crusades in our world were generally to the same people and the same places for the same reasons so like usually in our world the crusades were from christian europe to against the muslim middle east specifically jerusalem and and trying to to get jerusalem back into christian hands as they would claim in Theta's history, it, it's all over the place. You know, we've got Andraste against Tevinter. You've got the Chantry against the Cunari. You've got the Chantry against the Chantry. You've got um, the humans of Orle versus the Dales of the Elves. Like, th- there are all different reasons. So, for that reason, they're they're very different. Yeah. So, let's dive in to kind of more about these Exalted Ages. Yeah, so before I get into my fun facts, I just wanted to like give you a list of all of the exalted marches. Now we will we will go into all of these um throughout different episodes, but just this is kind of an overview episode as well as the first um exalted march episode. So 
this is the full list. Um, today we're talking about Andraste against the Tevinter Imperium, which occurred in about minus 180 ancient. This is the only exalted march that's not fully led or backed by the Chantry, and that's because it didn't exist yet. The next one is the Chantry versus the Dales, which started around 209 Glory Age. And then we have the Chantry versus Starkhaven, which um, started and ended in 280 Glory. Interesting that there are two in that age. Um, the next one is a little bit later, and it's the Chantry versus the Imperial Chantry. And that's a total of four, actually, all kind of lumped together. And that ranges in date from 440 Black Age to 510 Exalted. So that runs a range of about 70 years. And then the next one is the Chantry versus the Cunari. And this is another one where you've got several lumped together, and that's three total, ranging in date from 725 to 784 Storm. So that one is at least a little bit fewer years. Um, so there are 10 total Exalted Marches, not including ones that are contemplated. Um, and Something that I find really notable is that we haven't seen an exalted march since the Storm Age. I'm just going to say, we probably would have had one if it wasn't for Corey and Solus. Absolutely agree. Um, and that ties into what I was about to go into next, which is some of the contemplated um, exalted marches. There was a contemplated exalted march against Kirkwall after Anders. Which I think makes total and perfect sense. Of, of course, you know, a revered mother and a whole chantry has been blown up. Of course, the chantry wants to retaliate. A grand cleric, which I believe is a step above a yes. revered mother. Yes, that's right. Thank you for the correction. Um, and then there's a couple other contemplated ones. Both um, both the Kirkwall one and this next one I'm about to tell you occur in the Dragon Age. Um, the next one is against Orzammar, actually, interestingly enough. Um, and it's specific. It's a very specific situation. And it, it, it involves Brother Burkle's side quest. If the Warden helps Brother Burkle open a Chantry in Orzammar, he draws in actually a surprise surprising number of converts, which I think makes total sense when you consider the castless dwarves. Um, but they very quickly attract the fury of the more conservative dwarven only like uphold our, our moral superiority, that kind of political side from the dwarves. Um, they are very upset. They do, do not like it. Um, and so they try to restrict the rights of the Chantry in Orzammar. And obviously, Brother Burkle resists this and he ends up being killed, martyred during a demonstration. And so the assembly claims this was an accident, uh, but there, was, there, there are resulting riots. And this news reaches the Chantry where the divine contemplates a new exalted march. Does Haramont have to be king for that to happen? I don't think so. I think you just have to do um, Brother Burkle's side quest. I could see Balin like spinning it in a way of like, look, we're going to like have a Chantry going now. Like, let's get in good with the Chantry, maybe up the price on Lyrium and increase what we're doing here. Whereas Haramont would be the more traditionalist. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, it's just... It happens. Um, but then the other contemplated one is against the Grand Cathedral. And this actually is from the Divine Age. So um, basically what happened is that in the early Divine Age, the Chantry used the mages to light the flames of all the like torches present in every Chantry. And they didn't like that. And so the mages of Alroyo basically snuffed out all the sacred flames and protest and barricaded themselves in the choir loft, which more power to you. Um, and so the divine at that time, who was divine Ambrosia II, was outraged and attempted to order an exalted march on her own cathedral, which um, the Templars basically just vetoed that. They said, no, absolutely not. No way. You're not doing that. So the flames remained unlit for 21 days and negotiations were carried out and the mages eventually uh, backed down when the Navarran Accord was signed in 120. So all because you tried to use mages as your personal candle lighters. That's <laughs> right. why we have the Navarra Accord. No, that's not why we have the Navarran Accords. We have the Navarran Accords for a lot of different reasons. That's just one minor one. 
Nope, it's canon now. You heard it here on no. the Dragon Age lore no. cast. No, wrong. You did the not Navarra hear that. Accords happened because the Chantry used mages <laughs> as candle lighters. You heard that from Austin, not Shelby. From the Dragon that. Age lore cast. No, from Austin, who is the host of the Dragon Age lore cast, not the lore person. You said the host, as in I'm the only one. So, okay, let's word. move on. Let's move on into some fun facts. Sound good? My fact was fun. So, um, you know, Emperor Draken the First, we talk about him all the time. We'll do a character deep dive on him eventually, but he had a lot of military campaigns and attempts to unite Orle. We've established this, and he does this under the banner of the Maker, right? So his his campaigns, his military campaigns are often referred to both in the lore and outside in our world as exalted marches. But those those attempts are never included in the official count. My next one is that the people who fight for the Chantry and die during an exalted march as a result of battle or martyrdom or whatever else earn a special place at the side of the maker when they die. And they are referred to as, you guessed it, exalted. And then my last fun fact is that when Andraste and Maferath began their full march into Tevinter, they navigated their way by using a constellation. This constellation was Visus, and they believe that this constellation represented the gaze of the Maker, thus believing that the Maker guided their steps. And yes, G-A-Z-E, not G-A-Y-S, Austin. <laughs> I was just about to say the gaze of the maker. You mean the entire cast of Dragon Age 2? Dragon Age 2? I thought you were going to say Dragon Age Inquisition. Well, Dragon Age Origins. I mean, the religious character is gay as hell. Um, Just before we kind of like dive into this exalted <laughs> march, I do want to kind of raise the question. When we talk about Draken's military campaigns... Could you argue that the war against Corypheus is an exalted march? Um, I think if it had happened in the Divine Age, you absolutely could. And it probably would be in retrospect. But I think because it happens in the Dragon Age and because all of the exalted marches after Andraste's are led by the Chantry, no, it's not. What's your thought? Well, I would just say just kind of like these unofficial exalted marches that are kind of like classified there, but not in the official count. I think probably, it, you know, if we have a time jump in Dreadwolf, I would be it wouldn't surprise me to see the war against Corypheus like talked about as like this is one of those like unofficial exalted marches. Yeah, no, I get that. I definitely see that. All right. Are we ready to jump in into Andraste? Yeah, let's do it. Now, are we going to get repeat information that we've already talked about? No, we're not. So um, some of it may be a little bit familiar, but we're not going to talk about the religion. We're not really going to talk about her childhood. We're not going to talk about how she met Maferath. We're not going to talk about any of that stuff. And that's because we've already covered it in episode three, which is our Andrastianism episode. So in that, we go into her life, her accomplishments, her death especially and of course the religion that springs up so um we're not talking about any of that stuff today but you can go back and listen to episode three of our very first season if you do want that information so definitely go check it out all right well let's get into it all right so first i want to start with background to the war and not necessarily background to andraste but context that sets up how this war even happened. Um, when I was in college, you know, I minored in history and this was always the thing I found the most fascinating about wars. So if I go on too long, if I tangent or theorize too much, you're going to have to rein me back in. So just give me that heads up. Um, so I'm not going to give you like the entire background and context. Um, to this exalted march because some of it is in the Andraste episode, but just to give you a little bit of a refresher, her exalted march really rose up in the aftermath of the first blight. 
As a reminder, the first blight lasted for over 200 years, was devastating for all of Thetis, but especially for Tevinter. This is because, number one, Tevinter, due to a lot of the battles being fought in their territory, of course, but number two, because of religious unrest in their country, the first blight and its association with the old gods made the old gods an increasingly unpopular religion to be a member of. As we know, most people up to this point in Tevinter were members, were people who worshipped the old gods. So because of all this, and because it is the aftermath of a blight, Tevinter's army, even though it was the largest in Thetis, was very scattered and was smaller, much smaller than normal. Also, just a side theory, we can talk about this at the end. Andraste was born supposedly in minus 203 ancient, and supposedly the first blight ended that year. Is that a coincidence or is she like Kieran and has the soul of an old god? I think this is a highly likely and plausible theory that kind of comes into Andraste here, especially because like Morgan speaks of the dark ritual as something that she has been instructed in by Flemeth. And we know Flemeth is ancient beyond reckoning. And with, with beyond more that... Flemeth is actually Flem Mithal or Mithal reincarnated or living on or whatever. Is it possible that some incarnation of Mithal or Flemeth or whatever it was did some form of a dark ritual and Andraste is the resulting child of that? Because we know that Andraste grows up around Denerum, but that doesn't mean that she couldn't have been we don't know. Flemeth might have not always lived in the Kakari Wilds. She might have lived Well, let anywhere. me stop you. Let me stop you before you go on, because Flemeth is supposedly lives in the Towers Age, which is the Third Age. So we're getting timelines a little bit mixed up. You're a little bit too early. Right. But again, to another point of we don't know how long, if Flemeth is the first incarnation of Mythal, or if she is a second or third one. Yeah, absolutely. Or if Andraste is the first incarnation, reincarnation of Mythal. I've seen that theory floated around before. Um, but let's get, let's move on because we don't want to spend too long on this one. Um, so let's get into some of the background about the Alamari. So Andraste was born to her father and mother. Obviously, she got married to Mephrath at the age of 16. He was a chieftain of the Alamari, just like her father. Together, they built a unified border in their lands, which, again, as a reminder, is modern-day Ferelden. So they're building a border around Ferelden to resist Tevinter. And, like, the borders are not necessarily exactly like the current ones are, but in that general area. So, specifically, their lands, the Alamari lands, encompass the very fertile area of Orlais. So think, like, the Dales and the middle area up to modern day Navarra and the free marches and then over and down into the Ferelden Valley. So they, they basically had like all of Eastern Thetis. Um, So that's a lot of land. And of course there were differences among the various tribes who were united under Eldorath um, and Drasse's father. Some of them saw Tevinter as like public enemy number one who had to be eradicated as soon as possible. And others really didn't necessarily see Tevinter as a threat until, of course, the Tevinter Imperium sent soldiers and mages to carry out a raid against an Alamari settlement. This raid killed Eldorath, Andraste's father. They also kidnapped Andraste and sold her into slavery. The settlement was completely demolished. Nothing and no one was left. This is when the command of the Alamari forces passed to Mafrath, but a lot of people really didn't follow him until he was able to get Andraste back. Which kind of like sets the tone of Mafrath and Andraste's entire relationship. Because even from the get-go, it's like, we don't really follow you. We follow her. Right. And like, how do you not be bitter against your spouse when like you've been handed this leadership position and everybody's like, eh, you're fine, but we won't trust you. We won't follow you until you get your wife back. 
who you probably don't even love or care about. <laughs> right. Which is just interesting to a point of like, in ways, Matharath is trying to step up to leadership that is thrusted upon him. I'm not an apologist for him in any kind of way, but I get it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'd be bitter too, but at the same time, like, I'm not going to sell my wife to Tevinter to let her burn at the stake. But um, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So <laughs> I think my opinion is that this moment, her enslavement, along with the murder of a significant portion of her tribe, is what fueled her desire to burn to venter to the ground. Now, something that's sticking out to me that's interesting is like Andraste really does have this desire to see to venter burned to the ground. And like coming back from last week's episode where that's hero's goal too, um, is just kind of an interesting parallel to me. And that I said in there, when we were comparing Hera to Fenris, Adraste is not willing to sacrifice innocence to see it happen. No, no, she's not. Um, Hera obviously is. But so anyway, I think this is kind of like the starting point of the war. Like this is when the fuse has been lit, you know. Um, so when Andraste is released from slavery, she and Mafrath cross the Waking Sea and they start their march against Tevinter, and this begins in minus 180 ancient. She is 23 years old. She's very young. I don't think I had realized she was that young until I did all of this math. I mean, that's kind of just how it goes. Like, you don't really read the stories of the old brash, old brash hero rising up to create and pave a new way. It is always this young 20 to 30 something who's causing problems. I would love to see a story with an old brash hero. I feel like the oldest hero we get is Odysseus in the Odyssey. And he just causes all kinds of problems. Yeah, that's fair. I wouldn't call him a hero. <laughs> um, But anyway, so for some more background context, Andraste started preaching about the maker and her visions in minus 186 ancient. So that's about six years prior to their march. And she's about 17 at that point in time. So, you know, I think that's pretty significant that she's preaching that long um, about the maker before the march. It's not just something that she came up with on a whim. This is something that she's deeply committed to. Do you think she was preaching in the slave camp, like, and all the Tevinter slavers, like, we got this slave, this Alamari slave who's just, like, talking about this maker, only one god, what is going on? Yeah, I totally see that. I really do see that happening, for sure. Um, because why wouldn't she? Anyway, as they begin to to march on and eventually getting into Tevinter, there were like a lot of natural disasters happening throughout Thetis at this time, which again, I think helps Andraste and her armies push further into Tevinter than they would have if the situation had been different. And I think also because she's able to get this far and because there are these natural disasters happening and because the blight had just finished and all this stuff, I think helps convince a lot of people inside Tevinter that like, hey, maybe this Andraste lady is right about the maker. Maybe the old gods are wrong. Um, and so the people who are already Andraste's followers at the time of these natural disasters, they already believed that this was proof of the maker's wrath against Tevinter, as well as proof of their own like divine mission that they had been sent on this exalted march by the maker himself. I really think that Andraste's position in a slave camp punches a huge hole into the Andraste was a mage theory. Because if she was a mage, if she showed magical potential, she would be snatched up by a magister for their own experimentation. And I also think that the main place in universe that theory comes from is Tevinter, which, you know, Tevinter produces this whole, like, magic is might, magic is superior, is superior. So it's really bad for their image that if someone conquered them and beat them back really badly and wasn't a mage. 
And so Mm -hmm. they would spin that be like, well, well, she really was a mage. And that was how she was able to To cause so much trouble. I think after this, I'm now kind of like in the camp of Andraste wasn't a mage, mainly because I just want to give a big middle finger to Tevinter. That's, you know what? Fair. That's fair. But, um, you know, they continue fighting. Many of the magisters at this time were very concerned with the with their own civil unrest that was happening in Tevinter rather than like they just viewed them as like these barbaric upstart savages from Ferelden, which is horrific and terrible, but that's how they were viewed. So Andraste and her group, they really did not face the full might of Tevinter for a good portion, if not the majority of this exalted march. I cannot emphasize that enough. So speaking of of civil unrest in Tevinter, one of the major disruptions, as the magisters claimed, to regular life was the threat of slave rebellions. Slave rebellions regularly occurred in cities such as Valdorma, Marnus Pell, Solus, Morotheus, Hasmul, and others. These are cities that we've been to in the comics and Absolution that have have important names, etc. You get the picture. As you may know, however, the former slave and slave rebellion leader, Shartan, also known as Shartan the Liberator, does eventually join forces with Andraste. Now, we've gone over his story in our Andraste episode. We're not going to get into how he covered and how he joined Andraste or anything other than that because we've covered it. But go check out that episode. Um, But I did just want a few minutes talk about Shartan prior to joining the Exalted March, because I think this is important. He was the leader of a slave rebellion in Valdorma. He and his fellow rebels had been leading the rebellion for 20 days. This is when they met Havard the Aegis and ended up joining Andraste's fight, and they, of course, became friends. Even though Andraste was a human woman and Shartan an elven man, they probably had a lot in common because they'd both been enslaved by Tevinter. I think that the presence of Shartan in a leadership position in Andraste's army as well as Andraste's own story, probably inspired many other slave rebellions and uprisings. Thousands of former slaves would end up joining her army and fighting against Tevinter. I think this is like a crutch of Andraste's success, because I think that if the Alamari had kept pushing and they had not gotten the slave support or the Elven support, they would not have been able to really be as successful as they were against Tevinter, especially since Tevinter was basically holding back. When they got to some city like Minrathis, they might have been stopped there. But because of Shartan and his pull, they're able to greatly weaken Tevinter. Without Shartan, there is no Chantry. And I think that's that's a fact that the Chantry needs to come to terms with. And they do in a little bit if Liliana is divine, but... Yes. I very much agree. Very, very, very much agree, which again is part of the tragedy, I think, of the exalted march to the Dales. But that is something we'll get into in a couple of weeks. So um, let's talk about the main battle of the exalted march, which is the Battle of Valyrian Fields. And then we can get into our mid break after that. So this exalted march comes to a head with the Battle of Valyrian Fields in minus 171 ancient. This battle is the first time that they meet a true Tevinter resistance, and it was incredibly bloody. It basically turned from a siege into open fighting, and then another siege, and then back into open fighting, and this cycle happened multiple times. The Canticle of Shartan claims that Andraste and Maferath commanded over 10 thousand swords while Shartan had enough archers to quote turn the sky black with arrows however the armies of Tevinter were described as numberless with both warriors and mages so you can kind of imagine with those kind of descriptors what they're up against right I'm sure it was like a force like had never been seen before and like it's crazy to think about that this is like a fragmented Tevinter force. 
because they were devastated by the blight. The idea of Tevinter pre-blight terrifies me sometimes. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, we we've never seen Tevinter with that much power. Um, and I think it would be a force to behold. It feels like they'd be undefeatable. Right. So in the battle, during the battle, at some point, Andraste and her warriors find themselves basically circled by walls of ice, of course, created by the mages, which Shartan and his archers tried to melt with flaming arrows. In return, Andraste named him her champion in the middle of the battle and then took her mother's sword from her scabbard and gave it to Shartan, basically encouraging and commanding him to use it to free their people forever. Shartan called this sword Glandivalis. Unfortunately, we don't know what the word means, but you can find the sword in Act 3 of Dragon Age 2 after looting the demon Hybris. Do you remember if this is a one-handed sword or a great sword? I believe it's a great sword. So ultimately, Andraste and her followers do win this battle. They are able to defeat Tevinter and they emerge victorious, but they had suffered significant losses, like devastating losses. Um, I can't emphasize enough how many people that they had lost. Most of her top leadership, they were dead. Most of her army was dead. Um, so any chance of like moving forward, continuing this battle and, and having new battles after this is pretty much a, a, a cry for help. Like there's no way that it would be feasible. And she had been incredibly successful up to this point. Um, and I think that the end of this battle is the turning point for the exalted March. And we will get into what happens after this, after our break. Ah, Hawk stepped in the poopy. I love you. Want a sandwich? All this for me. And I didn't get Alexius anything. Send him a fruit basket. Everyone loves those. So welcome to the middle of the show where we talk about all things that have to do with the podcast, but not the lore of Dragon Age. Uh, it's here where we thank our patrons. And I remind you that you can join our Patreon. You can join us for our patron chat episodes uh, and get your name read out on the show. You can get ad free and early episodes, you get to vote on ma- monthly patron chat topics. I will remind you, if you want to join our patron chat, you need to sign up at our first enchanter tier or higher, and you can join us there. But other than that, I do want to thank a couple of our patrons from our first patrons, Genesis, our divine tier patron kit. And of course, a special thank you to the one, the only, the Nug King, Lewis H. Lewis was recently on last week's episode. So if you haven't given that a listen to, please go and listen to that. We talk about Dragon Age Absolution. If you can't support us on Patreon, please go to Apple and Spotify and like and review us. If you leave us a five-star review with some kind words, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. And so other than that, you can join us on Discord on the Cups podcasting and more, and you can hang out with us there. And you can find that link in the episode description. And Shelby, thankfully, that is all I have for the mid break. <laughs> Up there, giant icicle tits. Ice tittles. You're looking for titsicles. Oh, that's good. Yes, and it's. A real nice night for an evening. Um... Oh, you fear barbarians will swoop down upon you. Yes, swooping is bad. All right. So, I teased us before the mid-break that after the Battle of Valerian Fields is when everything changes. Um, And that's because if you know anything about Andraste and Mafrath, you know that Mafrath betrays Andraste. And so that's what we're about to get into. Um, and that's because, you know, while they had won significant battles so far, the losses that they suffered at the Battle of Valerian Fields combined with their choice not to reinforce the outposts that they had previously taken control of would basically lead to their downfall. Um, 
As they had pushed further and further into Tevinter, they had met more and more defenses, especially as they had made their way into the heartland of Tevinter. And this is where things begin to splinter because Andraste and her most fervent supporters are solely concerned with the Maker. They are only concerned with conquering Tevinter for the Maker specifically. But Mafarath and his supporters, because he did have some, especially the military leaders, the tacticians, if you will, are concerned that they would meet a decisive defeat if Tevinter's leadership turned away from their own civil unrest and unleashed the full force of their armies against Mafrath and Andraste. And frankly, Mafrath was right. They would have met a decisive defeat if that had happened. Um, but Mafrath decides to take actions and take matters into his own hands. And so in minus 170 ancient, which is about 10 years after the war had started, Mafrath travels to Minrathus in secret. And this is the capital of Tevinter. While he's there, he speaks with the Archon, and this is the Archon Hesarian, again, in secret. Mafarath proposed a truce. He would offer Andraste to Tevinter as a sacrifice. In return, Mafarath would receive the southern lands that they had already taken. The Archon agreed, obviously eager, very eager to end this war. Mafarath then allowed disguised Tevinter militants to enter their stronghold, which was located in Navarra, and which was where they had been stationed. Multiple people tried to stand up for Andraste, including Hector and Havard, but they were either killed or left for dead. Mafarath himself bound Andraste and took her to Hesarian to be executed. At the urging of his wife, Lady Vasilia, Hesarian organized a public and painful execution for Andraste. The Canticle of Apotheosis indicates that Chartan attempted and tried his best to storm the pyre to free her, but was cut down by arrows. So they have bound Andraste and put her on a pyre to burn her at the stake, basically. Halfway through this execution, Hesarian takes pity on Andraste and he drove his sword through her heart to put an end to the suffering. Far from consolidating the Imperium's power, Andraste's execution turned her into a martyr and sowed doubts among the Tevinter population. I am sad. I just thought about Andraste's Mavari. I know. I thought about that when I was making these notes and I was like, mm. you know, the Mabari probably died trying to protect her in Navara in the first place. Right. If the Mabari existed. Um, the Mabari existed. I don't know who you are. Right. Exactly. I just like, and I know that Matharath kind of like gets his what's coming you cannot pronounce this man's name. Whatever. I know he kind of gets his like just reward or whatever later when this comes about. But like, dude, I know you had doubts, but you had seen this woman do miraculous things. You just had to have a little faith more. And who knows? Maybe some, maybe, maybe if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be where we are. In 942 Dragon. I think that's fair, but I also think I also think that Mafarath is a cautionary tale, you know, of a person who's so blinded by their own convictions that they can't see outside of them. And I honestly think I think you can say the same thing for Andraste too. Um, because at the end of the day, neither of them are willing to compromise on their own positions. Mafarath is not willing to compromise the military side. He's not willing to compromise the tactics. And Andraste is not willing to com compromise on the beliefs, on the, the justification for this entire war. And at the end of the day, I respect both of them for that. Um, obviously, Mafarath does, does not handle the situation well. He, he could have made a lot of different choices. Um, but you can't say they didn't stick to their principles. 
Right. And I guess, you know, you're not really going to convince Andraste to sue for peace with Tevinter. Right. Right. Like, for her, the end of the war was the complete and total destruction of Tevinter. I don't think that was ever possible. Not without the backing of probably a lot more people in the Syrian. Probably, no, it wasn't going to happen. I I don't think it would be possible unless she was able to unite every other people group in Thetis. And not even Blights can do that. So, unless you have more thoughts, we can get into kind of the aftermath of this exalted march and all of its effects on Thetis. Let's do it. Okay, great. So... Because Maferath betrayed Andraste and handed her over to Tevinter, that officially made the war between the Alamari and Tevinter officially over. Tevinter did cede much of southern Thetis to the Alamari tribes, which meant that Maferath himself gained control of most of these lands. We've covered this history in some of our earliest episodes, specifically the Androstianism, Ferelden, and Orle episodes. So check those out for more information on who was granted what land and all of that. But to summarize what happened, Maferath and his sons ruled all of the lands south of Tevinter, including modern-day countries of Orle, Navarra, Ferelden, and the Free Marches. Maferath was pretty obviously preparing for Tevinter to attack again, and so he basically just could have a wall of armies at the ready. But the second attack never came. Um, so by, by 165 Ancient, Maferath had given the Dales to the Elves, as Andrasse had promised them, and in exchange for their help during the Exalted March. And also in the years after the march, Andraste's cult of the Maker continued to grow and grow significantly. And remember, this is before Emperor Draken I, a future emperor of Orle. It's before he organized and consolidated the Chantry under one banner. So this, this religion is just kind of growing at a grassroots level. It's just kind of spreading among the people. Like there's not Chantry buildings. There's not Chanter's boards. There's not the Chant of Light other than, than an oral tradition. Tradition. Um, it's not really probably written down anywhere yet. These things aren't standardized. They don't have chantry robes, you know, like that did not exist yet. Um, eventually, Havard the Aegis would go and claim Andraste's ashes from where she was burned at the stake. He brought her ashes all the way back to modern day Ferelden, specifically Haven, where they remained hidden until the events of Dragon Age Origins. And in Minus 160 Ancient, Archon Hesarian, who oversaw the burning of Andraste, was converted to Andrastianism. He forced Tevinter's worship of the old gods to end, and they officially began their worship of Andraste and the Maker. In this time of conversion, Hesarian revealed Maphrath's treachery against Andraste, which led to huge backlash against him throughout all of Thetis. Virtually no one continued to support him, even people who didn't worship the Maker. This backlash also extended to his family members, who had no part in the betrayal. Ultimately, his sons would end up killing Maphrath, and all of their lands sank into chaos and the countries ended up forming separate nations and that's kind of how this exalted march ends i have some discussion questions that i thought we could talk about unless you have thoughts before that i'm just curious now at this point we've always considered like hesarian's conversion to be like somewhat authentic you know Mm -hmm. he has mercy and all of that stuff but after reading this and hearing it all there, it seems ridiculously convenient that, you know, they're building up this coalition in all of Southern Thetis of this armies that can be called at a moment's notice to fight to venture. Well, then Hesarian reveals this betrayal and all of that goes to chaos. Mm -hmm. I can't help but wonder if that's intentional. And that if Hesarian is basically like, we need to weaken this future enemy. I definitely see where you're coming from with that. But I I do think it's genuine. Um, and I also think, I think it can be genuine and tactical at the same time. I don't necessarily think it has to be 100% one or the other. But I do think it's genuine, at least partially because like, 
he does gain something by sending the South into chaos. But at the same time, it's not like he's getting off scot-free. He's the one that burned her at the stake. He's the one that dealt the killing blow He by stabbing her. And so, like, he's not just sending the South into chaos. He's also bringing this back up for himself. He's also bringing all of this strife back on him, too, and bringing it back into the memory of the people. Because they will then be like, oh, well, you know, you're the one that killed her, though. So I do, I do think it's genuine. I also think it's a smart political move on his part, too. I just don't think it has to be one or the other. So what are your questions? Yeah, so I have two. Um, First is, do you think this Exalted March was successful? Why or why not? And then secondly, do you see Andraste and or Mafarath in a different light now? For this, I'm going to start with the second question. And for me, really just... I might have a more, a little bit, a uh, little more understanding for math for wrath, but I don't really see them in a different light because, you know, for me, Andraste is still this liberator and math for wrath is just, you know, the some schmuck je- who sold her out. <laughs> yeah. A jealous husband who sold her out. I mean, in a lot of ways, he thought he was doing what was right and what would ensure their survival the alamari survival because i'm sure there were people and military leaders who thought this would be the end of them like their people would be gone forever yes um but again like neither of them are seeing the bigger picture and so this kind of leads up to like is this exalted march successful is it successful in its immediate goal that it wanted which was burned down to venture no But it inadvertently leads to the formation of the Inquisition, which leads then to the formation of the Chantry, which then leads to a bunch of other things that happen. And then the the conversion of Tevinter to Androstianism and the formation of the Black Chantry. And so you could argue like, it was successful in creating something that would oppose to Venter of old. Because you could make the argument that like to Venter of old doesn't really exist anymore, even though I would say fragments of the old empire are all over the place in that community. But I think that if you want to talk about it being successful, I think it depends on what was it trying to accomplish in the goal that was stated by Andraste. No, it's not successful because Tevinter is still around and they are still a powerful force in the world of Thetis. Right. I think I agree with that. Um, I think Andraste, as she lived in Thetis in the ancient age after like right after she died, right? I think that she would say, no, this was not successful. I was, this was like, this should not have happened. This was wrong. Um, But I think if Andraste was able to come back to Thetis in the Dragon Age and kind of see, okay, well, like my teachings have spread throughout the entire country or throughout the entire um, globe, across countries, across races and we've built so many chantries and there's a divine and, and there's a chantry in like every little town. I think she maybe would have a different opinion. I think so. And I think that I would love for a sit down conversation to happen between Andraste, uh, Draken, Ameriden, and the Inquisitor from DAI. Mm. And just really just kind of sitting with all of them, thinking about what that accomplished and if something has been accomplished. And I'll be telling you, if I was the hero of Ferelden, I'd be hunting down for these other Magisters. Absolutely. Because you can count on two, even though Bioware wants us to forget about the architect. But... <laughs> they want us to forget about the sexiest Darkspawn we've ever seen. How dare they? No. But... I think I think it would be an interesting like conversation between all the heroes of the game and these other heroes of Androstenism and really kind of look at like what did this exalted march accomplish? It didn't accomplish, you know, destroying Tevinter for the maker, 
But did it accomplish the maker's will as Andraste understood it, I think is a different question. I agree with that. Do you have any other thoughts about anything that we've talked about thus far? No, I don't think so. I think I'm ready for our side character, which I am excited about because our side character, I have seen his name a lot because I have played the moment where you get the item with his name a million times. And so I'm excited to learn because I have never read any description of that item. All right. Well, great. So um, today's side character is Havard the Aegis. So what you're referring to is his um, his shield that you get in Dragon Age Origins. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So Havard the Aegis was a member of Andraste and Maffarath's army during this exalted march. Um, we have mentioned him a few times during this episode. He is a very important person. Not only was he a trusted warrior and member of the army, um, but Havard is the one who brought Andraste's ashes to Haven after her death and martyrdom. So he he's probably one of those exalted um, that we mentioned earlier in this episode. So I um, thought I would read from the Codex um, about Havard. It's This is from the Sacred Ashes of Andraste Codex. This is what it says. Bear with me. It's kind of long. Only one person witnessed Mafrath's betrayal, Havard the Aegis, a childhood friend of Mafrath. He accompanied his chief to the meeting with the Tevinters, not realizing what was planned. When he understood that Mafrath was giving Andraste over to be executed, Havard, unwilling to draw swords against his friend and liege, placed himself between Andraste and the Tevinter soldiers. The Tevinters struck him down and Mafrath left him for dead. Gravely wounded, Havard made his way to the gates of Minrathis to stop the execution. When he reached it, the terrible deed was already done. The armies on the plains long dispersed. Havard, cursing his weakness, gathered the earthly remains of Andraste that had been left to the wind and the rain, and he wept. When his fingers touched the pile of ash, his ears filled with song, and he saw before him a vision of Andraste, dressed in cloth made of starlight. She knelt at his side, saying, The Maker shall never forget you so long as I remember. The song faded and the vision with it, and Havard was alone. But his wounds were healed. With new strength, Havard took up the ashes of Our Lady and bore them back to the lands of the Alamari. And in the Codex quote, it says, This comes from the book Thetis, Myths and Legends by the one and only Brother Ferdinand Genetivi. So, this is basically the story of how Havard was able to survive that attack on the Navarran stronghold, how mm. he got to um, Andraste's ashes in Minrathis, and then how he was able to basically survive that and the journey back to Haven while he was injured. Um, and that's because he saw Andraste coming to him in a vision um, after touching the ashes. And that's, again, another reason why he knew they were important. So another thing that I found really interesting about this codex is the statement that Havard was Mafarath's friend first. Um, they met and became friends like during their childhood and they stayed friends as they became adults. And then, of course, he joined them and was right there with him when Mafarath and Andraste began their war in the Exalted March. So um, in addition, when Mafarath became the leader of the United Alamari tribes, Havard was right there with him. Again, he became a second in command. So I think it's really significant and just shows you his bravery and his courage that he did not approve of Mafrath handing Andraste over to Tevinter. And, and he wasn't just okay with standing by and, and being silent and going along with it. He refused to help Mafrath and defended Andraste instead. Um, I think that that's, really shows you his bravery and his courage and his character um, for sure. And, you know, he was injured and left for dead in his efforts to protect Andraste. And um, thankfully he didn't die, which again allowed him to retrieve her ashes and take them to Haven, like we've already talked about. 
We also get to meet Havard in game, or at least the spirit of Havard. He is one of the eight spirits that the hero of Ferelden encounters um, during the gauntlet in Haven. Um, and this is before you can retrieve the urn of sacred ashes. Havard's riddle is as follows. The bones of the world stretch towards the sky's embrace, veiled in white like a bride greeting her groom. Of what do I speak? Do you know the answer? Mountains. And no, you looked on the just, show notes. <laughs> I did not look on the show notes because I recently did this when I was playing Origins on the new Series X that we got to see how much better it ran, which it did run a lot better. Uh, but I knew it was mountains. And I have a lot of thoughts about this riddle, but if you have more to say, we could save it. Um, I was just going to say that I find this riddle fascinating that it speaks of brides and grooms when, you know, he was so devoted to the one who's named the bride of the maker. But um, if you have thoughts about this, this quote, go ahead. So I have two. The first is the obvious one. Like, obviously, his riddle is mountains because he brings the ashes back to the Frostback Mountains, to the mm -hmm. Alamari homelands and everything. What? Stood out to me this time, especially after our episode on the Alamari, is that he mentions the bones of the world stretch to the sky's embrace. Both the mountains and the sky have huge religious symbol symbolism in the Alamari religion. This is true and still and do for the Avar modern day. Right. Which I think is important. And I'm so glad that we did that episode before we did this, because I probably wouldn't have been able to see this. But I think in a lot of ways, Andraste is the mountain and the maker is the sky, especially with the language of the bride greeting her groom. Absolutely. We do end up seeing Havard in a few other locations. Most notably, of course, the shield Havard's Aegis that we mentioned earlier. We can get this shield after you loot the ogre at the end of the Tower of Ashal in Origins during or after the Battle of Ostagar. The other place we see mention of Havard, which really was, was out of left field. I was shocked by this. Grand Duchess Leontan of Orlais commissioned many statues of Havard. Some of the landmarks in Dragon Age Inquisition are of these statues. Specifically, in the Empress du Lion, you can find a statue surrounding the pools of the sun, and these statues depict Havard, supposedly. They are named Leontan's Steward. Here's a quote from the Landmark Codex. The statues decorating the pools of the sun depict Havard, Aegis of the Faith and Disciple of Andraste, bearing the prophet's ashes to safety. However, when Grand Duchess Leontine commissioned the statues for placement around the hot springs, she recommended her steward Bellamy to the sculptor for use as a model. Rumor has it that the steward Bellamy was Leontine's lover, and she wished to see his heroic form wherever she turned. Leontine commissioned at least a hundred of these statues of Havard. Can they just do something religious <laughs> for religious reasons? Like Orle, why do you got to be like this? Uh, it's because they're not, they're not actually, most of them are not actually religious. It's just cultural at this point, I think. Right. I just thought that was hilarious and I felt like I had to include it. Well, duh, obviously. So Havard, obviously big fan of Havard. What really sticks out to me is his name, Havard uh, the Aegis. Do you know what the Aegis is? I have no idea what an Aegis is. Please, please enlighten me. The Aegis is a shield carried by the goddess Athena that bears the head of Medusa. Okay. That, that Perseus cuts off and... Athena basically places it on his head and the shield basically causes great terror to anyone around it. So like Aegis becomes a word in our thing for just a shield. So he's really, you could read it as Havard the shield or the, sh the Aegis of faith, the shield of faith. And I think we can talk about this in a lot of ways because Havard carries Andraste back to the Frostback basin or frostback mountains into haven and 
places the ashes there. So in a lot of ways, he's the shield for Andraste. He literally puts himself as a shield between Andraste and the Tevinter soldiers. And by the end of the Exalted March, who is left to carry on Andraste's legacy? to carry on Andraste's word other than a couple of her followers. I mean, Hector is cut down in the attack on the Navarran stronghold. You know, Chartan is cut down at her execution. Who is left to spread this? Havard. And he's the one who has the vision. And what she says is that the maker shall never forget you as long as I remember. You know, he carries out this fate. And like, if it wasn't for her fart, if it wasn't for the Aegis, the shield, would we have Androstianism? Would we have a Chantry? Would we have anything? Yeah, I think that's a really fair question. And I think that that's a question that you can apply to a lot of different people in this story. I think you can... I think you can apply that to Maferath and Hesarian and Havard, of course, and even her parents and her sister and not everyone her life touched, Shartan, but a lot of people um, came together to create the perfect circumstances for this religion to kind of take off. Um, and so I agree with you. I think that that's really significant. I think I think Havard may be the most significant of all of them. Havard and Shartan, for me, are the top two. Havard, for me, by the time that it's the end and it's over, is the only one who I feel like knew the real Andraste. Mm. Like, knew who she was, like, before she gets venerated and everything. I would agree with that. I would probably add Shartan, too, but I definitely see what you're saying. I enjoyed this episode a lot. I enjoyed, uh, I really like Havard and everything that he kind of stands for. And so, Yeah. Me too. I really, really like nerded out a lot on this episode. I know it was kind of long, but I just feel like this topic makes up the basis of so much of Theta's history that we just couldn't cut it in half. You know, we just couldn't, we couldn't do it short. All right. Well, if you don't have anything else, I think we're ready to wrap it up. And thank a special thank you to our Nug King, Lewis H. Uh, thank you for your support. All right, well, thank you for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We will see you next week. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. You can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, join our Cups Podcasting and More Discord server. It's easily the best place on the internet. You can also support us financially through our Patreon. You can find us there on patreon.com slash Dragon Age Lorecast. The Dragon Age Lorecast is part of the Robots Radio Network. For more information about the Robots Radio Network, join the Discord server via the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed the show or learned something new today, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join the Patreon. And if you enjoyed our intro and outro music, give a big thank you to Pipe Man Studios. Thank you, Pipe Man. Thanks again for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. We'll see you next time. Do you love Dragon Age? Have you always wanted to learn more about its vast world and detailed lore? Are you still attached to your hero of Ferelden, even a decade after Dragon Age Origins came out? Or maybe you're a newer fan, still discovering a new tidbit or quest every day. Well, either way, the Dragon Age Lorecast is the podcast for you. I'm Austin, also known as Teacup. And I'm Shelby, also known as SheCup. And come and join us as we embark on a journey to explore and discover all things Dragon Age. We'll discuss all kinds of topics, from Lyrium to the Chantry and the great mysteries of the old gods, and even more that even you Bioware superfans might not know about. So come and listen on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And always remember... Swooping.